I want to begin this morning by addressing and maybe resolving, I think, one of the more controversial or highly debated topics around Advent. And that is, what is the best Christmas movie? Like, if, if you are going to sit down and you can only watch one, um, what Christmas movie are you, do you make sure that you see every year as a family? Die hard. Die hard? That, okay. We need to start there. Did Eric Elfman put you up to that? Where is he? Like, that's, that's, I think that's debatable in the category of Christmas music. A movie. Anyways. Anybody else? What else? What do you, what do you have? A Christmas Carol? The Muppet one. I was going to say there's like 47 versions, but you got to go with the Muppets. Okay. Good. It's a wonderful life. That's, that's definitely got to be in, in the mix of this conversation. Anybody else? White Christmas. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Elf? Elf is a new classic. I will agree with that. I'll put that. Anybody like Grinch fans here? Like you got to watch now. Are we talking Jim Carrey Grinch or are we talking classic Grinch? Okay, good. If you would have said Jim Carrey Grinch, we would have had to shut this whole thing down right now because... Um, my family, that movie for us is White Christmas. Um, every year, like right after Thanksgiving, one of the very first, there they are, Bing Crosby, Danny Kate. Look, check out that outfit, by the way. Like, they bedazzled like a cowboy, red cowboy shirt and turned it into a Santa costume. But um, every year after, after Thanksgiving, my family sits down and watches this Christmas classic, amongst others, but this is one that we always see together that we always watch there's something about it that's nostalgic for us and that we love and there's all this music and singing and if you don't know the story the essence of it is is that there is a it's the story really of a world war ii general who retires general general waverly is his name and um, the character is played by bing crosby and danny Kay, who were soldiers of his during world war ii um, through some circumstances, end up coming to this inn in Vermont and discovering that, that he is now sort of this kind of down on his luck innkeeper and owner of this inn in Vermont where there's no snow. And, and he's in threatened of going out of business and there's this, this kind of um, degree of, of angst that, that Bing Crosby and Danny Kay feel seeing this man in their life who was so powerful, who was so influential, who, who commanded its entire battalion, now sort of carrying firewood and cleaning up this, this inn. Like there's this disconnect for them. And I was thinking about this movie this week because it, it, it reminds me that when we have somebody in our life, there's this discomfort that we experience when we see somebody that in our minds personifying strength and power and might when we see them in a position of humility or, or weakness. And you, maybe you felt that at some point in time when you've seen a parent or a grandparent age, and maybe there's like a distance there and you go back and see them, they're just no longer able to do the things they used to be able to do, and it's just almost like there's this weird feeling that you get seeing them in, in that condition. And when we started this series last week, we're in this series entitled, He Shall Be Called. And we're looking together at these, these titles that, that Isaiah uses to describe the promised Messiah, our Savior. So just as a, a bit of a reminder here, when Isaiah is delivering this message to God's people, they, they find themselves in the midst of spiritual and national crisis. The, the people of God have been led through a series of kind of um, um, foolish and, and, and selfish kings into a place, for, they're being led further and further away from God and into a place of, of idol worship, away from genuine true worship of, of the one true God, Yahweh. And so Isaiah, as he's delivering this message, he's He's speaking very clearly these words of, of rebuke. He's delivering to them and saying, look, there's your, you will experience consequences as a result of this disobedience, as this a result of walking away from the one true God. But, but just alongside of that, and, and there's this, this powerful um, juxtaposition between these rebukes and then Isaiah's promises of hope, his, his promises of deliverance. 
In fact, he describes for us this the one who is the rescuer, who will be, as, as we saw, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Let's turn to, to Isaiah chapter 9. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to look at this passage again this morning just to sort of refresh our memories on what, what Isaiah describes to the people here. This is verse 6 and 7. He says, For to us a child is born, To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So last week, if you were here, we we took a little bit of time to look at the significance of that that title of Wonderful Counselor. The wisdom of God in in human form, Jesus then is both the experience of God's wisdom, but he's also the exercise or the activity of God's wisdom. So his, his wisdom is life and his counsel is to show us the love of the Father by revealing to us the good news of his kingdom. So this morning, before we really dive into taking a look at the title of Mighty God that Isaiah uses here in these verses, I want to just remind ourselves a little bit of of the timeline here. Isaiah is, is speaking this prophecy, these words of both rebuke and promise into the people of Israel about 700 years prior to the arrival of Jesus. So so when we talk about the idea of anticipation, of expectation, we have to recognize that there there is a significant gap here between this promise and the realization of it. And and I mention this because as I was thinking about this this week, I recognize in myself that I, I prefer a a degree of proximity between a promise being spoken and a promise being kept, right? Like we, we, we feel more comfortable when somebody says they're going to deliver on something and we can see, see that happening. But here in this, in this text, there are entire generations that are living and they're dying in the in-between, in, in the season of waiting. And I think that's, that's hard to do. The people have, have waited, they've longed for God's promised deliverance, and yet they would continue to wait till that's realized. And God proves himself faithful. He delivers on his promise. But even realizing that that, that, that came in, in this in-between season of people waiting and longing for and anticipating God's answer. And I mention this because I think we recognize that, that we live on the other side of the arrival of Jesus. We have the benefit of being there. And so as a result of that, we also have the benefit of relating to God in a whole new way and understanding his grace and forgiveness. We understand that he has ushered in a new kingdom and he invites us into that. And we're a part of this work and activity that he's doing in our world. And yet we also recognize that there is a future promise one where that kingdom will be delivered in fullness, one where there is no more suffering and no more pain. And so we too, we live in this this in-between. We live in that longing and that anticipation for a future day when, when he will reign in fullness. And in our waiting, sometimes there's doubt and there's pain and there's struggle. And yet we too, like the people of Israel, we wait with the expectation and hope because we serve the God who's able. We, we, we serve the God who is identified, entitled, mighty God. So this morning, I, I just want to take a few moments to look at the significance of Jesus being described, being anticipated as the one who is mighty God. And how do we understand God's might? And first, I want us to consider that God is mighty in capacity. He's mighty in capacity. So the first 
quality, the first aspect as it relates to understanding the might of the promised Savior is this aspect of his strength or his ability. And wrapping our heads around the, the, the idea of what is it that he's capable of. Like, when can you think of, or when was the last time that you had a moment when you were just amazed at the sort of scale of, of God, of his creation? When was the last time that, that he sort of took your, your breath away, I guess? I remember um, the very first summer that I led students down to our, our um, mission site in Ecuador, which is just on the side of a mountain outside of Quito. And part of the tradition, part of our experience with the kids is on the very last day, we would take them on what we call the perimeter hike up to the very top peak of, of the, the mountain that we, that we lived on, that we were at. Um, and this was my very first year ever doing this. So I didn't really know what to expect, and it was harder than I anticipated. Um, like my body was not adjusted to the altitude, and, and um, there was like 17 false peaks where you'd like look up and you'd see it, and you're like, yes, I'm there. And then you'd get there, and it's just like a plateau and another mountain, and, and you just kept walking and getting. But when we got to the top, we would leave about 4.30 in the morning. It was about a two-hour hike. And when we would get to the top, um, we would get there in time to watch the sunrise. And on that particular morning, the very first time I ever did this, it was crystal clear. Like, because you're that, that high of elevation in that area, around valleys and stuff, it's almost always cloudy. But on this morning, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And you could see the sun start to peak over the horizon, and as it does, it's just revealing this massive expanse. Like, I could look across the horizon. I could see every major mountain peak. I could see Cotopaxi, this volcano that, that, that um, is active in Ecuador. You could look around. I, could, I, I was speechless, breathless. Like, part of that was the altitude, but, but <laughs> the majority of it was just this incredible creation, something I had never seen before. And I remember what struck me in that moment was the massiveness of it. That, that God, just the scale and size of what he had created. See, I think that the scale, the measure, or, or how we understand his remite is, is, is partly revealed in this identification that this is not, he's not described as a mighty human. He's not called just a really capable mortal. This child that would be delivered is mighty God. And so if you are an Israelite who's hearing Isaiah speak this message into your situation, this hope of a promised Messiah, for him to be identified as mighty God, that was significant to you because of their history, because of what had gone before them. In fact, if you turn to the prophet Jeremiah, so Jeremiah comes a little bit later onto the scene. He's after Isaiah, but he's speaking into the same context, the same situation that Isaiah is speaking into. And he captures very much of this same idea that, that is ascribed here in this title. This is Isaiah or uh, Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm going to read verse 17 through 23 and then jump down to verse 27. It says, ah, sovereign Lord. Even that, there's this expression of, of um, um, emotional sort of being overwhelmed. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of the children after them. So he's addressing again the situation that Israel's in. And he says, great and mighty God, whose name is Lord Almighty. Great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You re reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. You performed signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued to this day in Israel and among all mankind and have gained the renown that is still yours. You brought your people out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. You gave them this land you had sworn to give their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey you or follow your law. And they did not do what you commanded them to do, so you brought all this disaster on them. So again, you hear Jeremiah speaking into this. And then down in verse 27, this is God responding to Jeremiah's prayer. He says, I am the Lord. 
the God of all mankind, is anything too hard for me? So, so Jeremiah, much like Isaiah, is speaking into the, this reality that the people have walked away from God, that their hearts are far from him, and, and that they are experiencing the result of this. But, but again, he, God does not abandon them there. He, he does not leave them in the mess of their own making, but rather he, he's going to restore and redeem. He's going to do what he, he is going to do what he can do. He's, he's going to accomplish it because he is the one who is able, because he is the one who is mighty God. What's too hard for him, the prophet asked. Jeremiah, Jeremiah reminds the people of, of their previous experience of God's might that they were people living in captivity in the land of Egypt. He says in verse 21, you brought your people out of Israel and out of Egypt with, or out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. So he reminds the people of their experience of God's might. He reminds them that, that, that when they were in captivity, that God brought plagues into Egypt in order to reveal to Pharaoh that he's not the one in charge. He reminds them that when they were pinned against the Red Sea and the entire might of, of, of Egypt's military was bearing down on them, that God literally drew up the Red Sea so that they could walk across in safety. And then as, as, as Egypt, the Egyptians enter into that, he, he closes again in order to protect and provide for them. He reminds them that he led them as a looming pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And we could go on and on and on. And then, and then following Jeremiah's prayer here, God speaks in verse 27. He reestates this very same point. I am the Lord. The God of all mankind is anything too hard for me. See, what Jeremiah, what Isaiah are, are describing for us here is the God who is able. The God where, where nothing is too difficult. Isaiah, as he describes this future hope, this promised Messiah, says he is the one who can get it done. He is mighty God. He is our God who is able. And see, as powerful as this word is, as it's spoken to the people of Israel some 700 years before the arrival of Jesus, I think it, it applies in even a greater sense to you and I on this side of the cross. Because as impressive as it was that God would dry up the Red Sea, as impressive as it was that he provided manna in the desert for the people, that pales in comparison to the empty tomb. In fact, if you flip over to the book of Ephesians, Paul is, is going to speak to this very point as it relates to understanding God's ability, his capacity in our lives. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authorities, power and dominion, every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. See, all of this, what, what, what Paul writes to the church, what Isaiah is, is speaking to the people of Israel in chapter 9, all of it is revealing to us what our God is able to do. The same God that is able to, to bring life out of death is the mighty God that, that we worship and that we serve. And all of this, when we go back to that idea of being in that, that place of waiting, when we're in that in-between, I think Isaiah here, of all the titles that he uses, of everything that he wants them to know about their promised hope, the reality that he is their mighty God, the reality from Ephesians 1 that this is the power of our God, I think it speaks most directly into that, into that sense of waiting, that, that time between promise spoken and promise delivered in the midst of the longing for a future, future hope 
And the realization, the awareness that he is mighty in capacity. He's, he is the God who is able. Secondly, then, I think we see that, that for him to be referred to as, as being mighty God, we need to understand that he's mighty in purpose. He's mighty in purpose. So Isaiah is not only helping them capture his, his capacity, his strength and ability, but he also speaks towards using this term mighty as, towards his purpose and towards his ultimate victory. In fact, this word that Isaiah used, the, you see it most oftentimes applied in the context of like a military or a, a, a political situation, like a mighty warrior, which is not generally the way that we think about Jesus. That's generally the, the imagery that, that we conjure up. One of, the, um, one of the holiday traditions that in my family growing up as a kid is Thanksgiving, Christmas, we would always go up to visit my grandma and grandpa dining her up in northern Ohio, about three hours away from where we lived. And we had, it's my mom's side of the family, we had cousins up there, and one of our traditions, we had so many fun things that we would do. Like my grandpa would hook sleds up behind his farm all tractor and drag us out through the pasture and just whip us around. Like you would just see cousins going flying in every which direction. And it was always like a, a family football game. And the key to the family football game was just the kids. So it was just me and my cousins and my brothers. The key to the family football game was to get on my older brother Scott's team. Because my older brother was the, the oldest grandchild, and he was four years older than me. And, and as a result, he was much bigger and much stronger and just way more capable than any of the rest of us. And what you would find is that if you were on Scott's team, you were guaranteed victory. Because there was like this, and what would happen is like, even when it was just me and my two brothers and my cousin Shane, we'd play two on two football and it would be me and Shane because we were the two middle and then my little brother and my older brother. And we could stop them a couple downs, like they would try to give it to my little brother and we'd tackle him or do whatever. And, but inevitably on fourth down, they had a play where Scott would just go out there and my brother would just loft it up and it, he would catch it every time and then just sort of push us over and run in for a touchdown. Because there was nothing we could do to stop him. Because he was so much bigger and stronger and able that we are. It was guaranteed victory every time if you could get on Scott's team. See, what Isaiah is speaking into the life of, of the people here is to understand the ultimate outcome here. That there is, God in his might has guaranteed victory. The, this is the result of the one who is the mighty God. This is also the reason, by the way, that sometimes there's so much misguided expectations around who Jesus was going to be. You see this in the, in the Christmas story. When, when Herod, by way of the Magi, hears the news that there has been a baby who's going to be king of the Jews, right? Matthew chapter 2. And he grabs his advisors and, and he has them peruse all of the prophecies about who this child would be. And he sees these things about him being mighty God and, and wonderful counselor and everlasting father, prince of peace. He sees that he is proclaimed the one king of the Jews. And Herod views that and understands what Jesus is coming to do is to overthrow his rule and reign and power. And in fact, it says in verse 3 of Matthew 2 that when Herod heard this news that he was distressed in all Jerusalem with him because he viewed his role as mighty God to come in and to overthrow the, the political structure that was in place. This is so much of what the Jewish people were anticipating in the arrival of Messiah. You can hear it in Isaiah. You can understand why they sort of view this way with all this talk about government and rule and reign. And so in their mind, when Messiah arrives, he's going to overthrow the oppressors. Rome is going to be kicked out. And once again, there's going to be a righteous king sitting on the throne of, of David. This, this is the guaranteed victory that they imagined. But there is a far greater victory because he defeats a far greater enemy. Jesus came, as we know now, not to defeat or overthrow Rome, but to defeat sin and, and death. But this is the victory that, that mighty God came to secure for us. If you flip over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, 
The writer describes it this way, and I think this is such an a- apropos sort of understanding as it relates to the outcome of what Jesus would accomplish. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So speaking of the incarnation, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So now we begin to understand the nature of the victory that he came to secure. This is the result of his might. This is the outcome of what he would accomplish, that that he transforms by grace through faith, spiritual death into life, from from spiritual slavery into freedom. If you recall this morning when we we started out talking about that, that uncomfortableness that we feel when we see power and strength in the midst of humility and weakness. And I think this is what's so extraordinary about what we celebrate and remember at Advent. That that our mighty God who would come on our behalf, that the method by which he would liberate his people from the reality of sin and death would be to humble himself. Would be, as as Philippians says in chapter 2, to make himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. This This is what we ultimately discover is his might It's most profoundly seen, most profoundly known through his death on the cross. His might is displayed in humility and he ultimately secures our greatest victory. He is the God who is mighty in purpose. And then lastly, then we understand that he is the God who is mighty in motivation. Mighty in motivation. Back in Isaiah chapter 9, just at the end of verse 7, Midway through verse 7, it says he's going to reign on David's throne. Again, you hear kind of what, what the people are anticipating in this language and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I had a friend um, in college or after college I got to know, and he, he went out he lived in California, went to college in California. He met his girlfriend and eventual fiance and now wife out in California, but she was from here in Chicago. And he told me the time when, when they were engaged and he was just desperate to see her. And so he got in his car and this was like before the time of podcasts and like streaming anything and just drove straight from um, his home in, in California out to her home in Chicago, 30 hours, only stopped for fuel in the bathroom and like a Mountain Dew, you know, would load up. And here's the thing, his car had no functioning radio. Like he drove 30 hours in silence straight to go see Christina. Like that's, that's love, people. That's crazy love, right? Look at this, this, this last part of this verse. It says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, this this phrase here, this is an indication of the why, of the motivation behind his might, of his zeal. That's not a word that we we use every day in, in our conversations. It's not something that we typically describe our motivations as, but it's one of those words that in Hebrew carries such this depth of meaning, this intensity behind it. Because that word implies uh, almost like a sense of jealousy, like exclusivity in relationship, like an unwillingness to to share. That word means a strong desire and a, a deep devotion. So then the question becomes, what is his zeal for? Well, what is the object of this strong desire and this deep devotion that he feels? When Isaiah is writing this, he, he, he wants the people of Israel to understand this is how God feels about you. When you understand it in the overarching scope of his plan of salvation, he's saying this zeal that he feels is for you, it's for us, it's for me. This is what motivates him. This is what's behind him. This is what would cause him to do whatever it takes to reach us, to be with us. This is what drives, what motivates his might. He loves you deeply. 
So much so that He would become one of us in order to redeem us. I don't know this morning how, how loved you felt when you walked in this room. I don't know how, how if you walked in feeling or wondering how much you're loved or who loves you. You may have even walked in this morning questioning how much God loves you or if he loves you. But know and understand this today. It is his unquenchable love for you that motivated him to come all this way for you specifically you, to display his might in the humility of a human child and to declare victory once and for all over sin and death through his gospel, all because he loves you that much. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come together, as we thank you again for who you are, for what you have done and your power in exercising and revealing to us your might and your strength. Lord, we are reminded again that what motivated that, what drove that, that experience was this deep passion, this strong desire for relationship with us, for us to be restored and returned to what you created us to be. Lord, thank you again for that love. Thank you for displaying your might and humility and weakness by becoming one of us. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.